We are um, part of the HDB network. We're um, part of the HDB family, so we go to focus in the summer. We're a CRT network church, if that means. There we are, another cheer. Come on, thank you. Um, and we love to hang out. I would love to say hi to you. So um, if I haven't met you yet, will you please come and find me at the end of the service? I'll probably be somewhere around here herding a, a group of small children. It's fine. They belong to me. I'm really sorry. They run around at the end of the service. I can't. I can't they get it from their dad, okay? I just, I don't know what to tell you. Last week, someone told me that they were licking the carpet. I d don't let that put you off. I do really want to say hello to you. So please, we want to work out what does it look like for you to be a citizen at Citizen Church. So come and say hi, because we want to, we want to talk about that. So I've got a question for you to get started this morning. What feels like a waste of time to you? What really mugs you off time-wise? I am feeling hot and bothered thinking about some of my examples, so I'll just run through them. 20 miles an hour. <laughs> the less said about that, the better, okay? You know it's annoying. The next one, right, you're in McDonald's. You've, pa you've paid at the one window, you've drived up to the next window, you're waiting. And she says, oh, sorry, could you just park up over there and I'll bring it out to you? I haven't got minutes to wait. It was a mayo chicken that I wasn't supposed to be having anyway. Come on, what a waste of time. Ugh, so annoying. Right, next one, my dog. He will not go for a walk in the rain. I put the lead on. It's like the drizzle, the Welsh drizzle. It's not actual rain. You're going to be fine. I pull. I, I, I gear him up. He's like, no, mum. No, mum, I'm not going to move. I'm like, please, come on. Please. I put my wellies on for the... No. No, he just waits. Waste of time. Final one. Okay. I know you all know this feeling. You've sat down with a coffee or your poison of choice. You're ready to work, finally. You've opened the laptop lid. You know what I'm gonna say. You're ready. Okay, you're gonna do some work. Motivation has finally come. Updates. Updates. Ah, what a waste of time, it's so annoying. Well, I hope this morning that being in church doesn't feel like a waste of time. But I just wanna let you know that you're welcome here if it does feel like that. Sometimes you feel like you're on the fence about it. I've been there as well. I hope you at least got a nice coffee and a decent croissant. And now you've got to listen to me talking about a colossal waste of time. So how fun is that? We're still in Colossians and it's great to be here. We're going to be going through chapter two today. And I'm here. Uh, you've probably heard my dulcet tones before because I like to host a lot, but I haven't taught the Bible in ages. I'm really excited to be here. I hope to teach in a way that's culturally attentive. I'm really inspired in my work by people like John Tyson, Mark Sayers, John Mark Homer, and they're looking at the waters that we're swimming in as a culture and society. They're saying, what is going on here and how do we make sense of Christian living in 2024? In a post-COVID world with a cost of living crisis, a looming general election, and big questions that hang over us like, is it okay to use my non-stick frying pan? And should I be worried about ultra-processed food? And are we on the brink of a world war? What a book to be studying at such a time as this, with colossal questions like that. Paul, I don't think, mentions Teflon specifically in Colossians, but he has some really helpful and hopeful things to say about what it looks like to follow Jesus, to stay on track, and to not get distracted by things that might waste our time. As I said, we've been in Colossians for a while. Some of you might have noticed that Mark split the preaching into like ver two or three verses here, four verses there. Well, not for me. He gave me 23. So buckle up because I'm going to read the teaching text for today. We're in Colossians 2 and it's verses 4 to 23. They're going to come on the screen now for you. Or you can get out your Bible. I know. <laughs> Shock. So I am telling you this so that no one may deceive you with fine-sounding arguments. For although I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit. I am delighted to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your life in him, rooted built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition or the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. 
For in Christ, the fullness of the deity lived in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and every authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of our sins. And having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he took it away and nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink with regard to religious festival, new moon day celebrations, or even Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that are to come. The reality is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such person will also go into great detail about what they have seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with their head. I love that line, sorry. They've lost their head. (laughs) From whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows and God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have nothing to do with these things, are all destined to perish with use. They're based merely on human commands and teachings. Such regulations, indeed, have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Whew. Well, thanks for having me. It was lovely to end. <laughs> Let's pray together, and I will dive in. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, be with us this morning as we open your word and look to you again, God. May we continue to live lives rooted in you, Jesus, built up and strengthened in the faith, overflowing with thankfulness. May we live lives that are not convinced by reasonable sounding arguments and instead lives which are solid in you. May we rely on you, Jesus, and resist the temptation to trust in anything else that this world might offer. Amen. So, did you think of any other things that feel like a waste of time while I was wittering? If you're English, you might be familiar with the Bryn Glass Tunnels. What an infurious, infuriating waste of time to get home. Two lanes, two lanes to leave the whole of Wales, it's ridiculous. Another one, hair talk videos on that side of TikTok. You've probably seen them. They teach you how to put your claw clip in properly or to plait your hair. Lots of them involve oils. Well, they all say the same thing. It's rosemary oil. You don't need to watch any more hair talk videos. I don't need to. Anyway, the final one, this one, you, I, so you've done a load of washing. Someone's laughing. You know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Right. The drum has stopped spinning. There's no water to be seen. It's done. We're finished here. We need to move on with our lives. But the three minutes on the clock, it won't let you open the door. Why? What a total waste of time. You'd have a think about any more that just rile you up like that. Anyway, so Paul, our main man, he's got a list of things for us in, Ch- in Colossians that feel like a waste of time to the church in Colossae. Things that might threaten the church or the faith. Let's be honest, you don't write a line like, may you be rooted and built up in the faith like you were taught, unless you're specifically concerned <laughs> that something is going to uproot it, do you? He's being... He's being clear. He's highlighted potential areas for concern. He's included a reliance on human worldly-based philosophy, Jewish legalism, mysticism, and this kind of something about austere, strict living, you know, that feels like cause for concern. 
And hopefully you've heard a little bit about the Colossians over our previous sermons. But if you haven't, just to recap, this is Paul. He's a follower of Jesus. He's writing to the Colossians. He hadn't actually met them, but he's just checking in with them. He's sending them a letter, and he wants to give them some encouragement and some pointers. And I wonder, what would Paul's letter say if he wrote to the church in Cardiff? What would our letter say? What might he include as a warning? What might he suggest to us was a colossal waste of time? I don't know if you've driven down Whitchurch Road recently, but if you're coming with um, from the Gabalva roundabout, down Whitchurch Road, there's a line of shops and restaurants um, kind of near the top. And there's a new Pilates studio up there. It's got some gorgeous signing. It's very subtle and quite trendy. It's really expensive. But one of the signs on the front says, change your body, find your soul. Change your body, find your soul. That's the ad campaign for this studio. And I just wonder, like, how many of us actually believe that that might be a little bit true? Like somewhere deep inside, do we think that if we do enough reformer Pilates or go on enough runs or exercise enough, that the impact might be a healing that runs so deep that it alters part of us on the inside? Find your soul. That is quite a claim. Research repeatedly tells us that over 90% of people, all people, struggle with body image in one way or another, and nearly 98% of women, when surveyed, struggle with a desire to change the way that they look. But your body is good. It was made by God. It was made for God to worship him. God determined that bodies were so good that he put his only son into one. The fullness of Christ dwelled in a body. And by moving yours or exercising it or training it, you are not going to release a connection to your inner self that changes the trajectory of your life. Might Paul's letter to Cardiff include some reminders that, in fact, moving your body could help you in lots of ways, but the only person who's going to heal your soul is Jesus Paul says, see to it that you are not convinced by fine-sounding arguments. And that does sound quite good, doesn't it? Move your body and transform your inner world, like I'm nearly convinced. (laughs) But only through Jesus can we truly experience a mind-body-soul connection. These bodies, they were made to worship. We lift our hands in worship, we sing in worship, we hug our loved ones. It's worship. And yes, endorphins are fantastic, and exercise has been proven again and again to decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and even dementia. And the aesthetic changes that come from changing your weight composition can be at best pleasing and at worst addictive. But you should exercise because you want to have a body that can worship God for the long haul not because you're trying to find your soul. It isn't in being thinner or bigger that you'll find the mysteries of God revealed. What else might Paul mention, do you think? One thing that comes up for me, manifesting. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive with a hollow and deceptive theology or philosophy that depends on human tradition. I just wonder if Paul might have a little dig at that if he was writing a letter. You know, crystals, but he'd be just, he would give them a little nod. Manifesting good vibes so that something resonates with you is not the same thing as prayer. The particles of the universe are not aligning because you said so. They're doing that because he said so. And if something goes wrong in this world, it's not because you didn't do enough or say enough or because your horoscope was bad this week. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. The Bible says that the tongue is a powerful weapon that shapes lives, but it's not that powerful. (laughs) There is this tempting school of thought that suggests that you're in control of your reality by speaking it into being. 
That's just not it. You don't need a telescope or a microscope or a horoscope to realize that the fullness of Christ is available to you. And the universe is empty without him. Emptiness is what you find at the end of those philosophies and schools of thought. They are a waste of time. Okay, another one. Cult of the 5 a.m. club. Hmm? Hmm? Life-changing, apparently. Uh, Paul is definitely getting a jab about that in there. It's Dear Stephen Bartlett. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Diary of a CEO podcast, though. I'm not being funny. Every single one of his guests gets up at the butt crack of dawn. <laughs> and the message that we receive is push yourself, believe that you can do it, get up early and pursue your wellness goals to change your life. And we've all been there, haven't we? We plot it out in our heads. We say, oh, if I get up at X and I achieve Y, my life is going to look so much better. I will be better. And then the morning comes around and, oh my gosh, is it 5 a.m. already? No, snooze. And then it goes off again. Ooh, dim deal. Snooze. <laughs> no, no, still not quite ready for that snooze. I think that kind of thing was an issue for the Colossians as well. Paul addresses it at the end of this passage. Or I'm, I think he's getting at a similar line of thinking. He says, such regulations have the appearance of wisdom, but they lack any value in restraining your sensual indulgence. He's saying, be as strict as you want, honey, but you're not safeguarding your life against sin. And look, some people really are early birds, and all power to you if you are. But you don't need to believe a lie that getting up early or harshly dictating rules around your behavior is going to fundamentally change who you are. This letter that Paul wrote 2,000 years ago, it's specific, isn't it? It was for them and for then, but it simultaneously feels so relevant to today because it's all-encompassing. Being a Christian is confusing. It's hard work. Like, how am I supposed to live my life? What matters? What doesn't matter? And I know that there is a spiritual realm, but I don't really know how to make sense of that in my day-to-day -day life. What is deja vu? What is that? Why does that happen? Why do I always see a robin when I'm thinking about my beloved late grandmother? Or how is it that you can fly to a different country on holiday and still bump into Jill from down the road? What is that? Why does that happen? I'm trying to find the words for when those weird things happen that feel spiritual in nature, that kind of make you question everything. Do you know what I mean? I bet you have stories of weird things like that. And Paul knows. He literally prays in verse 2 of chapter 2 about the mystery of God. He prays for the Colossians that they would have wisdom and knowledge and complete understanding. I think I like this little life, but it doesn't make sense. Why do these random things happen? Why, does bad things, why do bad things happen? And if you're as confused as I am, you are not alone. Silicon Valley has tapped into this insecurity. Big Zodiac, hand in hand with big tech, and it's associated apps, programs, and revenue streams that let you download a horoscope or learn how to manifest are worth an estimated 2.5 billion pounds worldwide. Paul is issuing a warning. He's bringing us back on course so that you don't find yourself saying things like, on the one breath, oh, Jesus, I am so thankful for my life. And on the other, I am manifesting some chickens. My husband's giving me the evils. He doesn't want us to get chickens. Pray for me. So, or maybe so that you don't hear in your mind, if you were thinner, then you would be accepted or worthy or good enough. Or maybe even worse, early in the morning, you didn't follow the rules of engagement and you were not disciplined enough. And this has happened because you lost motivation. Paul says, no, stop that noise. Verse 14 and 15, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away and nailed it to the cross. He says, that which stood against you and condemned you in the first place was the thing that made you in debt. 
He's taken it away. He has disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them on the cross. The message translation of the Bible says of verses 11 to 15, entering into fullness is not something that you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping to a long list of rules. You're already in. You're an insider. It's not through some secretive initiation, right? But what Christ has done for you by destroying the power of sin. You were stuck in an old sin-dead life. You were incapable of responding to God, but God has brought you alive alongside Jesus. Think of it. All of your sins have been forgiven. The slate has been wiped clean, and that old arrest warrant with your name on it cancelled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped the spiritual tyrants of the universe and their sham authority at the cross. So what are some of the stories that you've been telling yourself? Some mantras or philosophies that have trickled into your thinking that are wasting your time, like change your body, find your soul, or get up at 5 a.m. and alter your entire life. There's no judgment around any of those thoughts or beliefs or ideas that you've been holding on to. We're all just trying to make sense of sin, aren't we? This life is awful sometimes. Things don't go the way that you planned or hoped. It doesn't make sense. We do the things that we don't want to do. It's confusing. I've got a theology degree and I still can't make sense of it. You don't get the job, your expectations weren't met, people die and they leave us. Or even worse, the people that we were expecting to arrive don't. And Paul talks about it, he's honest about it. He talks about our sinful flesh and the brokenness of this world. When we were dead in our sin, he says, verse 13. But God made us alive in Christ and forgave it all. The whole self that was ruled by the flesh has been changed and brought to fullness. We have been brought to fullness. A full life. I think that's what Paul is getting at in this letter. It's a reminder of the fullness of life. That we can live fully awake, reconciled to the creator of the universe. But we have to stay focused because it's really hard. There are powers of darkness that are going after your heart and they're trying to confuse you. They're trying to tell you that the only way that you can find love is to go on a program for six weeks to Mallorca with strangers and cameras. Or they're trying to tell you that your body is only acceptable if your forehead doesn't wrinkle. There are all of these different thinkings of the day that will distract you from a full life in Jesus. That is what Paul's getting at. Things which are a colossal waste of time. He is saying spiritual fullness in Christ comes from acknowledging your sinfulness, or as the Bible calls it, your fleshly nature, and trusting that Jesus has made it right, that you have had a circumcision of your fleshly nature, something as drastic as that, that was ripped away from your being when Christ died. That's what happened. And thinking about or dwelling on anything else really is a colossal waste of time. So I hope you've identified some time wasters in your life. I hope you've been thinking as I've been wittering, you know, maybe you've got your own examples, but what are we going to do about them? We're going to pause. We're going to try and take those thoughts captive. We're going to pray. We'll have an opportunity to pray together at the end of the service. And if you've been thinking, oh, actually, some of my thoughts are being affected by the messages of today, and I am getting confused about what the message of the gospel is, When Mark says, raise your hand if that's you, raise your hand. We want to pray for you. We want to stand with you. The purpose of Christian community is to keep you strengthened and rooted. We're supposed to do this together. Every video you watch these days says, I hope this changes your life like it changes mine. Hacks are not going to change your life. You don't need to purchase a $23.99 guide or sign up to a 14-day challenge. You need the hope of Jesus. 
A theologian that I read in preparation for this talk, he said it like this. He said, given the earlier stress on the cosmic scope of Christ's lordship, it should come as no surprise that the writer of this letter expects the reader's behavior to reflect this reality. But the motivation stressed here is not about obedience to the Lord. It's about living in the resources of the relationship that comes from being incorporated into him. That is the full force of the phrase, in him. So we've all got struggles with sin and we've all got a struggle with an understanding of what goes wrong in the world. We've got cultural messaging that seems reasonable and convincing sometimes. And suddenly, Paul's letter to the Colossians doesn't feel quite so aggressive. It feels necessary and kind. The crux of this message, the central part of Colossians, is that the gospel and our understanding of what Jesus has done in our lives is the ultimate, but it's really hard to hold on to. We get muddled and distracted and we believe weird things to be true because we can't make sense of sin. And we have all of these weird occurrences in our lives that are probably spiritual in nature. And all, the effect of all of that is that we reduce the gospel down into thinking that it's just about being rescued from this world and this body. That if we change it or deny it or we get in control of it, that it will all be okay. But living in Jesus is about making sense of this today. Living in fullness in this body and in this faith and in this life today. By joining in with the divine purposes and plans that God has for your life and living in fullness and freedom today. Amen.